October 7, 2008. A Qantas flight from Singapore to Perth was sailing smoothly at 37,000 feet. The weather was perfect, the crew experienced, and the passengers relaxed. Then, without warning, something deep inside the aircraft systems began to go very wrong. What started as a normal day in the sky quickly spiraled into one of the most shocking mid-air incidents as the plane pitched violently toward the ocean twice, exposing one of the strangest computer malfunctions in aviation history. So, what exactly caused one of the world's most advanced airliners to dive on its own? And how did the crew keep it from ending in disaster? In this video, we will piece together the events that turned Qantas Flight 72 into an unforgettable fight for control. On the morning of October 7, 2008, Qantas Flight 72 lifted off from Singapore's Changji Airport bound for Perth, Western Australia. It was a routine service for Australia's national airline, flown by one of the most advanced aircraft in its fleet, a wide-body Airbus A330-300 carrying 303 passengers and 12 crew members. At the controls was Captain Kevin Sullivan, a veteran pilot with over 10,000 flight hours, joined by First Officer Peter Lipset, equal experienced, and second officer Ross Hales there to rotate in for rest breaks during the long journey across the Indian Ocean. The weather was clear, the air smooth, and the flight was progressing exactly as expected. By 12.39 p.m., the crew had settled into cruise at 37,000 feet. Lipset stepped out for his scheduled rest, and Hales took over the right-hand seat. In the cabin, passengers were relaxed, some reading, others sleeping, and a few moving about. The seatbelt sign was off, as there was no hint of turbulence. Deep inside the aircraft's avionics bay, though, a problem was beginning to unfold silently. One of the three Air Data Inertial Reference Units, ADIRU-1, began producing corrupted binary data. Specifically, altitude readings were being mislabeled as angle of attack data. To a flight computer, that swap is a dangerous mix-up. The bits and bytes, arranged in 32-bit words, now carried the wrong labels, but they still passed the usual validity checks. This meant the bad information slipped into the flight computer's calculations unnoticed. Even worse, the fault wasn't just occasional, it sent repeated bursts of wrong data, setting up the conditions for the chaos that would follow. As the aircraft cruised over the remote waters northwest of Australia, the pilots were still unaware that their flight control system was quietly arming itself for a series of violent, uncommanded maneuvers. And in just moments, the first clear sign of trouble would erupt, starting with a sudden autopilot disconnect and a wave of alarms that no one in the cockpit had ever experienced before. At 12.40 p.m., without warning, the autopilot on Qantas Flight 72 disengaged. A chime sounded in the cockpit, and Captain Sullivan immediately took manual control. Within seconds, the flight deck displays lit up with caution and warning messages. The ECAM began spitting out fault notifications in rapid succession, NAV IR1 faults, GPS errors, and contradictory oral alerts telling the crew they were both stalling and overspeeding. These warnings were impossible to reconcile, yet they kept coming, flooding the pilot's attention. The cause was buried deep in ADIRU, one's corrupted outputs. Two sharp spikes in the false angle of attack data, each spaced about 1.2 seconds apart, slipped through the flight control primary computer's comparison checks. This exploited a flaw in the system's timing logic, which remembered a last known good value long enough for bad data to sneak past the filter. Once through, the faulty readings activated two protective systems at the exact same time, high AOA protection and anti-pitch-up compensation. Each commanded a nose-down input, and together they forced a sudden maximum 10-degree elevator deflection. The effect in cruise flight was violent. The aircraft pitched down sharply, generating negative G-forces that lifted anyone not strapped in off their feet. Around 60 passengers who were seated without seatbelts slammed into the ceiling. 
ceiling, striking hard enough to shatter panels and break service units. Several crew members were in the aisles and were thrown into the overhead bins. Luggage compartments burst open, sending bags, laptops, and food crashing into the aisles. Drinks sprayed through the air, and loose items became dangerous projectiles. In the cockpit, Sullivan pulled on the side stick to recover, but at first, the flight controls didn't respond. For a few seconds, the automation locked him out, holding the nose down. Only after the corrupted spike cleared did the elevators respond, allowing him to level the aircraft. As gravity returned, those who had been pinned to the ceiling crashed back down into seats, aisles, and each other, adding to the injuries. The cabin was now in complete chaos, but the danger wasn't over. The pilots had barely caught their breath when the unthinkable happened again. Three minutes after the first pitch down, the second uncommanded pitch down struck. This time, the nose dropped about three degrees, five degrees, with a plus 0.2 g-force change and a loss of another 400 feet. Although the g-forces weren't as severe as the first plunge, many on board were already injured, disoriented, or attempting to assist others. Several of those still out of their seats were thrown into the ceiling again. The chaos inside the cabin deepened as more items were hurled across the aisles. Inside the flight deck, the crew faced an avalanche of distractions. The autopilot was locked out, leaving them in full manual control, but their displays were littered with fault messages. Stall and overspeed warnings continued to sound in an endless cycle, adding to the noise and confusion. Communication between pilots and cabin crew became urgent and fragmented as reports of serious injuries flooded in. By the end of the ordeal, 119 of the 315 people on board were hurt, 12 of them seriously, with injuries ranging from spinal trauma and fractures to severe lacerations. With the air aircraft unstable and dozened injured, the crew had to make a critical decision to get on the ground immediately. Once the second uncommanded dive ended, Captain Sullivan knew the flight could not continue to Perth. The aircraft was still throwing fault messages, the alarms wouldn't stop, and they had no guarantee that another pitch down wasn't moments away. He instructed First Officer Lipset, who was now back in the cockpit despite his broken nose, to declare a pan-pan to air traffic control, reporting serious flight control issues and multiple injuries on board. Four minutes later, after hearing from the cabin crew that passed passengers had broken bones, deep cuts, and possible spinal injuries, Sullivan upgraded the call to a full May Day. The decision was made to divert to Learmonth Airport in Western Australia, about 150 kilometers away. The approach was flown entirely in manual mode, as the autopilot remained offline, and the stabilizer trim had to be adjusted by hand. Fault messages kept flashing, but the crew pushed through them, prioritizing a stable descent. On the ground, emergency services were already mobilizing. Learmonth small facilities weren't equipped for such a large-scale medical emergency, so the Royal Flying Doctor Service and CareFlight were dispatched to airlift the most seriously injured to hospitals in Perth. Others were treated locally or transported by road. When the aircraft rolled to a stop at 1.32 p.m., the extent of the cabin damage became clear. Ceiling panels were shattered and misaligned, passenger service units were ripped from their mounts, and debris covered the aisles. Bloodstains marked the seats and walls. The scene looked less like the inside of a modern airliner and more like the aftermath of a violent accident on the ground. In the days that followed, Qantas faced criticism over its handling of passenger compensation. The airline offered travel credits to some injured passengers, which many felt undervalued the trauma and ongoing medical costs. Several crew members suffered long-term consequences, including flight attendant Fuzzy Mayava, whose injury ended his career and left lasting physical pain. Some pursued legal action, while others simply tried to recover in private. While the immediate crisis was over, the real mystery was only beginning. Investigators had to figure out how a modern airliner's flight computer could be fooled so completely and whether it could happen again. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau's investigation into Qantas, Flight 72 was one of the most complex in its history. It concluded that the sequence began with a rare malfunction inside ADIRU-1, the computer responsible for processing airspeed, altitude, and angle of attack data. This malfunction produced bursts of corrupted information that bypassed all the cross-checks meant to detect bad readings. The flight control primary computer's timing logic had a design gap 
gap. When faulty angle of attack spikes appeared at just the right intervals, they slipped through the validation process and were treated as genuine. Once accepted, those false readings triggered automatic pitch down commands. While the exact trigger inside Adiru 1 was never conclusively identified, it was an incredibly rare occurrence. But the fact that it could bypass so many safeguards was the real safety concern. Out of 128 million hours of service for that Adiru model, this this type of failure had only been recorded three times. Airbus and regulators acted quickly. Within days, Airbus issued a bulletin instructing pilots to switch off any ADIRU, showing a NAVIR fault. The European Union Aviation Safety Agency followed with an emergency airworthiness directive, making that procedure mandatory. Airbus also rewrote the logic inside the flight control software, closing the loophole that allowed timing-based spikes to get through. They added new stress tests to simulate intermittent data errors, something not previously part of certification. The incident became a case study in how even extremely remote software faults can have real-world consequences when aircraft systems grow more interconnected. It also raised uncomfortable questions. How many other undetected flaws might be sitting in modern flight computers, waiting for the exact combination of conditions to appear? Could other critical systems, navigation, engine control, braking, be vulnerable to a similar chain of events. The aviation industry began looking more seriously at cosmic ray interference and rare computer logic failures, but much of the research is still ongoing. So what's your take on this wild incident? Drop your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more gripping aviation stories. Until next time, safe travels.